All right, guys. So now with the ADAS quiz behind us, we're ready to move on to the new content for this chapter, chapter 13, where we're talking about all of the challenges we face when the business cycle and real GDP don't move the way they normally should. Um, the first topic we'll take up is unemployment, and I'm just going to use a PowerPoint to guide you through the major points. Um, you guys have this PowerPoint here for handouts. And you just have to choose which way you want to take notes today, okay? So uh, I'm going to get this started here. Um, a lot of students ask me, um, why do we have to know so much about the economy that doesn't really seem to affect us? And I think we've talked about this before. You guys, before the break, watched the video Poor Kids, and we saw the issue of child poverty. Um, though none of, Keeping in mind, none of those kids chose to be in that situation. Um, it makes the situation pretty severe. So um, given our situation in South Lake, I wanted you to watch a short little video on um, why this is important for the rest of us, because ultimately, if you're trying to make sure consumption stays strong at 70% of all GDP, you can't be narrow minded or blindsided uh, by all of this. So take a quick look at this video. I once saw a high school teacher lead a simple, powerful exercise to teach his class about privilege and social mobility. He started by giving each student a scrap piece of paper and asked them to crumple it up. Then he moved the recycling bin to the front of the room. He said, the game is simple. You all represent the country's population, and everyone in the country has a chance to become wealthy and move into the upper class. To move into the upper class, all you must do is throw your wadded up paper into the bin while sitting in your seat. The students in the back of the room immediately piped up saying, this is unfair. They could see the rows of students in front of them had a much better chance. Everyone took their shots and, as expected, most of the students in the front made it, but not all, and only a few students in the back of the room made it. He concluded by saying, the closer you were to the recycling bin, the better your odds. This is what privilege looks like. Did you notice how the only ones who complained about fairness were in the back of the room? By contrast, people in the front of the room were less likely to be aware of the privilege they were born into. All they can see is 10 feet between them and their goal. Your job as students who are receiving an education is to be aware of your privilege and use this particular privilege called education to do your best to achieve great things, all the while advocating for those in the rows behind you. All right, so taking a look at that, that kind of frames perspective for why we need to know how this economy works if we're going to keep it healthy for all of us. So um, had we been in the classroom, guys, I would have demonstrated that for you, moving the, the recycle bin all around the room. I would have given you bonus points if you made it in. So I think you can see how that would have worked if we had been face to face. Um, that's really important for you to grasp. It's not just about what you can see in front of you. It's about everything that you can see behind you. If you are a corporate big wig trying to sell something to people who can't buy it, then your profit lines are, are going to be affected too. And I've said that before. So that's why we spend so much time understanding how this game is played. Um, you guys can see in front of you um, an image of a pinball machine, and it shows you the numbers that we're trying to hit. Um, it basically allows you to see that everything, um, the government, uh, Federal Reserve, households, businesses, they all have a role to play in keeping this uh, ball moving. Um, this is basically what we've been talking about so far with everything adding up to be either AD or real GDP. So these are numbers I want you to memorize. I want you to know that gross domestic product should increase at a rate of 4% or more. Um, that number is a minimum that we want. You guys can see from our last classes, we've <clears throat> not really achieved that a lot here lately. Um, CPI is a measure of inflation that we're going to talk about. We want that to be no more than, say, 3%, any more than 3%, and prices are going to be unstable to the point businesses don't hire people and consumers don't know what they're ultimately going to pay. So we'll talk about the consumer price index and inflation a little bit later. Unemployment, um, we don't want any more than, say, 6% nationwide is the national average. Um, any more than that, we're getting to the point where we have a destabilizing uh, force on the economy that might push us down into that range one. So these are the numbers we're really trying to hit to make sure that we're in the happy place uh, in range two, where we can have growth, 
We have a little unemployment, a little inflation, but not so much so that um, it destabilizes everything we're trying to accomplish. Um, again, now guys, this is a minimum number. These are maximum numbers. So just keep it straight. Um, you'll see questions on the test that reference these numbers. And as long as you remember what they are, then you'll be okay. Okay. For unemployment, though, let's take a look at that one problem. We're going to have to know the different kinds of unemployment, and we're also going to know uh, need to know how it's calculated. Now, I won't make you do math on the test, but it's probably a good idea to know what's counted and not counted, just like we would know for GDP. So uh, more on that in a second. Um, there are different kinds of unemployment that you need to know for the test. And what I would like for you to write down or annotate is the definitions I'm telling you, because you're likely to see them again on the vocab quiz and the test. Frictional unemployment, um, the way I remember that is that it's self-selected almost. It could happen at any time. You know, people have the right to leave their jobs that they're not happy with, regardless of what's going on in the economic business cycle. Um, we have that freedom as Americans to take a job and say, I'm not going to do it anymore um, and walk anytime we want. So we have the choice to be frictionally unemployed. Um, an example of a frictionally unemployed person might be a college kid who's just graduated, um, who basically could take a job at Starbucks or McDonald's, but has been trained at the Ph.D. level. Um, if they decide not to take that lower form of, of, of employment, then they are choosing to wait until the first big job arrives. That, that duration, they are frictionally unemployed. Okay, So think of that as self-selected frictional unemployment that happens at any point in the business cycle. The next kind is technological. Um, as you guys find, uh, most of our production uh, facilities like Amazon, um, several of those warehouses, they're all automated. There are lots and lots of people who now consider themselves to be technologically unemployed because a robot or a process has changed, right? Um, that is going to happen regardless of where we are in the business cycle. Innovation is key. So um, you're not likely to see us move backwards and bring those old jobs back. We're just basically innovating as the economy changes. Structural unemployment comes from the fact that sometimes the whole structure of the economy changes or is disrupted. So um, the example of this would be the 1950s milkman scenario, right? Where, you know, you used to have these empty bottles you set out every day to get your milk. Well, we don't, the structure of the economy is so different now. We do that for ourselves. So that job is just no longer needed. Um, maybe we could say that structural unemployment references jobs that have become obsolete, if that helps you. Um, um, frictional then would be self-selected. Technological, think robot lost jobs for structural. Think about um, the milkman and the fact that he's, he's got an obsolete job. For seasonal unemployment, as the calendars move from winter, spring, summer, fall, um, you're going to see jobs that come online and then disappear for a while, right? Highly likely that you'll see more jobs for lifeguards and such uh, in the summer than you would probably in the winter. Uh, in the winter, we're going to see ski instructors and all kinds of stuff like that, but those change as the seasons change, okay? Now, all four of these are basically going to happen no matter what's going on with the business cycle. So the last form I'll share with you is cyclical unemployment. Um, this is what happens whenever unemployment goes above 6%. We know that the economy is about to go into a dip or is doing well based on what we see this number do. 6% um, is tolerable, but any more than that, we can say that we have some cyclical unemployment that's due to the business cycle, which you see in the word, okay? So um, on your test, you'll have case scenarios. You'll have to classify people who happen to be unemployed as one of these five. So just be familiar with the definitions as we move forward. Uh, measuring unemployment. Um, you need to kind of know, again, where this number comes from. I won't make you do the math, but ultimately it's helpful to know who's counted and who's not. Um, for the unemployment rate, you need to know uh, the number of people unemployed is divided by something called the civilian workforce. Now, guys, the civilian workforce has, a, has an interesting definition. It is not the general population. So there are several groups that are left out here, and this is what you would probably need to write down for this slide. The civilian workforce is people who are aged from 16 to 65. 
And as you guys know, Americans are living a lot longer. So we're not even looking at a large portion of the people outside of that age group who might be affecting our unemployment reality. Okay, so already the civilian workforce has kind of been cut and trimmed on the side. Another group that the civilian workforce does not count, the um, institutionalized people who may be, uh, have found themselves incarcerated in prisons um, or hospitalized in, in um, recovery facilities, those people could do gainful employment, but they're not part of the civilian workforce number. Um, another group of people who are not uh, counted, that would be your um, armed services workers, your Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, they are non-civilian. So um, you can imagine any time uh, someone leaves the army and comes into the workforce, our numbers for unemployment are going to be affected. So um, they are, are not counted as part of this. Another group that's not counted, um, the underemployed people who have jobs below what their pay grade really should be. Um, that may be something that we're seeing right now with people desperate to stay employed. They've taken jobs um, just to kind of keep a check uh, coming in, right? So that's not even considered when we look at the unemployment rate. Um, the last group of people who are not counted, couch potatoes, right? People who just hang out with mom and dad, stay at home on the couch. I mean, it's almost impossible to track those people. Um, in the state of Texas, if you're going to claim unemployment compensation, you, you have to report your attempts to find a job on a biweekly basis. Every two weeks, you're giving phone numbers, websites, you're listing how many resumes you've, you've tried. I mean, your, your job during your unemployment is to find another job and it takes a full time commitment. So I want to kind of change your thinking about people who find themselves as part of this number, these are the people who are hitting the pavement. They are looking for jobs and as hard as they're trying, they're just not finding them. Okay. So um, we need to think about, you know, not being critical of people who are on the unemployment because we're not even talking about couch potatoes, potatoes or people who are lazy. These are the people who are actively seeking work, but the economy is just not providing them jobs. Okay. So this number um, basically is determined by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, that is um, an agency that's part of the Department of Labor. That is a cabinet office of the President of the United States. So again, I want you to know where the number is coming from. Okay. Um, I say here it's seasonally adjusted, so it removes some of the confusion about spiking unemployment by taking out seasonal um, um, unemployment. So um, the number that we're looking at um, is pretty significant. When this number comes out from the BLS, guys, you can expect an immediate reaction on Wall Street. And coming up soon, um, every single month, um, we get a new update for, um, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So um, by the end of class, I'll have you look at that website. Okay. Um, here is a sample problem. Okay. If we were doing the math, we would have to basically figure out the size of the civilian workforce first. You would add the two groups of people together, the unemployed plus the employed, and that would give you an unemployment rate of five and a half percent. Now, my question at five and a half percent unemployment, is the federal government going to like do a whole bunch to get that number down? Highly likely not. OK, um, you need to understand that full employment currently in the United States is defined as unemployment rates of between five to six percent. Even though that's a lot of people out of work, you're not going to see intensive policy actions until that number goes above six. Um, for example, in the coronavirus situation, if we have a spike in unemployment and it goes over six, that's when you will start hearing people clamor for jobs and really kind of advocate for more job growth as a real policy initiative. But that won't happen until we see a number that's above six percent. So um, that should help you with that. Now, we've looked at unemployment a lot of different ways. And you remember the production possibilities curves. Um, capital goods and consumer goods provide us the trade-off, but if we're anywhere under that curve where that line represents 100%, then we've got this gap between reality and where we actually should be. That's called the GDP gap, and it's a measure of how or to what extent we are unemployed in the economy. Um, you know that you can find um, unemployment at the bottom of your business cycle in the middle of a trough, so that's where you're likely to find your largest numbers. 
And you now know from ADNAS that that's synonymous with range one of your curve, okay? Um, by now, I hope that you're seeing that with AD shifting from the left and to the right, it basically creates the pattern of the highs and lows of the business cycle. So um, our goal is to get that back into range two as promptly as we can. So I want you to be aware of that, okay? Uh, measuring unemployment over time. This is um, a, a highlighted version of recessions that we've experienced in the last, say, 20, 30 years. And what you see in the grayed out areas are periods of recession. Take a look at what happens to the unemployment rate, right? It spikes. Um, people are let go pretty quickly in order to curb costs. And you can see overnight in the Great Recession, we went somewhere from around 5% practically up to double digit unemployment, like overnight. That was surprising and shocking because that hadn't happened since the Great Depression. So um, we're just kind of waiting to see. This is what it felt like and looked like as I was teaching back in 2008. Suddenly the economy tanked and we had a huge spike. So um, that could happen again. Um, because unemployment's a bit understated, when we see that number at say five and a half percent, we need to add back um, basically um, those people who are not counted to get a realistic unemployment rate. Um, there you can see your way out of this, right? If you want to protect yourself against unemployment, you're, you're basically going to be better off with more education, more training. Um, misery index, just so that you know this definition, guys, that is a measure of both um, the, the um, inflation rate and the unemployment rate, and that's how uncomfortable it can be within the economy. So really a struggle in the early 70s, again in the early 80s. Um, what we've been through here recently was not so bad. Inflation wasn't as strong. So there have been situations where consumer discomfort was worse. but. All right, I'm going to take a short little break, guys. Uh, we'll come back to uh, the notes on inflation, but uh, sit tight and I'll get this queued up for you. Thanks a lot.